Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Woolastook River, the St. John in New Brunswick. I'm standing here right in the city of Fredericton, right behind the Beaverbrook Art Gallery, and this is the second day of our St. John River Summit. This is our ninth annual event, and we're excited to be here to share with you some of the climate adaptation work that is happening along the river, particularly in the Fredericton region. Right behind me, actually, you can see the river, and in fact, just on the other side is where we celebrated our traditional welcome yesterday with Elder Ramona Nicholas, which really helped us to understand the connection between the people, the river, and the presence of the Maliseet, the Woolastukwiuk, over the last 14,000 years. This river has been here for thousands and thousands of years. It has flooded for thousands of years. Unfortunately, though, over the last number of decades, we've seen an increase in frequency and intensity of rain and storm-related events that's led to significant flooding in the region. The St. John River is integral to the character of New Brunswick and the many communities along its banks. Today we're going to talk about a number of activities that are happening here, but first I'd like to give you a bit of a synopsis of our work in the region. I work for WWF Canada and we've been here for eight years helping communities and habitats thrive. It's important that we have catalysts and conveners and facilitators that can help bring so many partners together to ensure a healthy and resilient river. Our work has been varied over the last number of years, but certainly in the last five, we've spent a lot of time working on climate adaptation. This started with vulnerability assessments for communities along the river, places like Florenceville, Bristol, Heartland, and Woodstock, where we've worked with community members, business members, citizens, municipal governments, provincial governments, and many other actors to understand how they're vulnerable to the changing climate, with a particular attention on flooding. From there, we've moved to adaptation planning and then most recently have also worked on the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative uh, in Florenceville, Bristol. Municipal Natural Assets is a way of valuing our natural assets, our forests, our wetlands, um, and everything else that we have around us to help combat climate change. We are facing a serious uphill battle. The dual crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss are significant not only in this region but across the country. We have over 50 rare and endangered species along this whole watershed, many of them with significant cultural relevance and part of an important ecosystem that makes this area unique. In yesterday's workshop, we spent a lot of time hearing about some of the things that are happening along the river. The summit is an opportunity to learn, share, discuss and experience the river and yesterday was really the learning day. Um, we heard from uh, the province of New Brunswick about climate change and how it impacts the river and what we can expect to see in the future. Things like a drier summer, uh, lower water levels, higher frequency and intensity of storms, tropical storms, ice storms and that sort of thing. That was followed by a presentation from our research partners at Brock University talking about a climate knowledge network survey that they're in the process of completing. We heard about some preliminary results about how the various actors up and down the river are connected to one another, what they are working on, and also how they can better work with one another to ensure a healthy and resilient system. We also heard from the St. John River Society on some climate messaging that they've been working on. This is an integral piece that will follow the Climate Knowledge Network survey and help us to better communicate with one another pre, post, and during flood events. It happens. We can expect an annual flood here. It's called the Spring Freshet and it's been happening for a long time. We need to be more prepared for that and a big part of that is the messaging so that we can understand what needs to be done not only to protect ourselves but to protect the important environments and rare species around us. Yesterday's session I think was quite informative and today we're going to switch gears a bit. We're going to actually visit a number of sites in and around the Fredericton region here and see what the City of Fredericton and other partners are doing to ensure a healthy and resilient river. This includes riparian restoration projects, green living walls, and talking about how individual neighborhoods and, and parts of the downtown are responding to flooding. This is really exciting for us. We're excited to be here and doing this live with you and giving you a first-hand view of, of some of the work that's happening in the region. And I hope that you'll follow up with us in due course if you have questions or want further information. I'd like to thank our partners, RSA Canada. Through RSA Canada's support and funding, WWF Canada is collaborating with community partners to assess vulnerabilities and develop adaptation plans that include restoring ecosystems and building natural infrastructure. 
Today we are joined by our co-hosts from the City of Fredericton. They have been an integral part of us making the summit a success. And I'd like to introduce to you Jody Boone. Jody is a project engineer with the City of Fredericton. Has, I think, a probably close to about a 20-year career here at this point. <laughs> it and feels that way. feels that way sometimes, especially during flooding season. Um, Jody, what can you tell us um, about the history of flooding along the river in this part of the river? Yeah, sure, Simon. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the river's been flooding for a millennia. Uh, I guess we've seen our fourth highest flood in, in 2018, uh, and that was precursored by the flood in 2008, which was an elevation of 8.36 meters. Uh, with our, our second highest flood in 1973, that was 8.61 meters. And the highest recorded flood we've, we've seen is, uh, was 1936, and that was 8.9 meters. Quite significant then, not, not what we're seeing here today. Yeah, that's right, today. I think today it's around an elevation of one and a half, two meters. Yeah, well that's great. Um, and what happens in the downtown core when, when flooding happens? So in the downtown core, there, there's a few pieces that we see. Uh, our operations department manages it uh, daily and hourly, I guess. So we, we obviously see impacts to, uh, the, throughout the community, way, the ways people get into town. Uh, one of the first things that starts happening is we start losing some of our service parking lots. Uh, then some different intersections through the downtown start to get flooded. Uh, and once they start getting flooded, uh, we really see changes in, the, in people's access to parking, getting around businesses and sometimes they're homes. So once some of the intersections start starting to go underwater, uh, the next thing we see is some, some of the back streets. Uh, once you get through the first part of downtown, as you start heading towards the hill part, uh, it actually gets a little bit lower. So we see the back part of downtown flood first. Then the next thing that starts happening as the flood rises, we start losing some of the ramps of the bridge. Uh, and we know that that's a large commuter route. There's about 100,000 vehicles a day across the bridge. So when we start losing some of the ramps, uh, we really start seeing some significant, some significant impacts to the way people move about. Uh, on the flip side of that, we, we do see an increase in an active transportation. Uh, we've, we've tried to increase our transit routes, uh, frequencies, and, and help access to that. I think uh, a couple years ago, we provided some free transit during the flooding because we know there's uh, parking loss. And, and the walking bridge, we see about 630,000 crossings a year across the, the walking bridge. So there's starting to be a large uptake in, in that, and we know that uh, we're looking at increasing the routes so people can access downtown during those flood periods. Yeah, so it's really quite significant. I don't live right in town. I live a bit outside of town, and certainly when flooding happens, I make every effort to not come into town. It is a, it is a significant um, inconvenience, and I, a lot of people won't realize that uh, the whole downtown core and a couple of the neighborhoods are actually built on a terrace, are built in the floodplain. Historically, uh, this area has flooded, and, and we've um, obviously settled here uh, and have been settled here for quite some time. And, uh, and now have to deal with this increased in intensity and in frequency of, of storms. Mm -hmm. um, in some of those back neighborhoods um, and, and that, that flood more than, than the downtown core, um, what are some of the steps that, that you guys are taking to help uh, move that forward and, and address the issues? Yeah, sure. So I guess to start out, every project we, we look to, to work in the city, uh, we try to get the best bang for a buck. And what I mean by that is, is we look at projects that have uh, every asset is at or near end of life or has some significant problems. So when we approach those projects, we want to make sure that uh, we get the best value for a dollar. So we want to capture if there's any water and sewer problems, but in the downtown, we, we focus on, is there any mitigation uh, things we can take care of? Can we put some valves in? Can we put berms, raise some roads, uh, or increase the size of the, the storm pipes underground? Uh, and to help facilitate this, we, we've uh, initiated the DMAF program, which is the Disaster uh, Mitigation Adaptation Fund. Uh, so we've looked at four different streams with this funding to, to help provide us some, some backing and funding so we can, we can actually advance these projects quicker than we would have been able to without them. So with these projects, we've looked at key transportation infrastructure. So can we put, put install berms, raise trails, raise roads? Uh, how can we get people moving better around the city to, to get to the businesses and their homes? Uh, the next thing is critical municipal, municipal infrastructure. So uh, do we have lift stations that are low in the area? Uh, do we need to keep some operation centers going? Uh, how can we improve some of them or what are some pieces of equipment we need for those things? Uh, the next part of that is uh, key or, uh, watershed management. So 
what are what are some wetlands that we have that we can improve, uh, maybe acquire? Uh, are there storm pipes that we can install in those outer watersheds? Because not just the flooding we've been seeing increasing, and as you mentioned before, it's also the increased rainfall events. So uh, we do also have some problems in outlying areas. Uh, due to our topography, we have a lot of different watersheds. So there's a lot of different pipes to manage and, and watersheds. So that's another area we're looking at. And finally, it's uh, trying to mitigate any impacts in neighborhoods. So uh, what can we do to help protect any homes? And, and I guess I say protect, but it's really mitigate. Uh, because really what we're trying to do is slow down the impacts of those houses. How can we get them get, to get back in their homes quicker during the flood and really shorten the amount of time that they see impacts from flooding? Yeah, that's great to hear. And, and what's interesting is it's a, it's a mix of activity, right? Um, there are some mitigation related activities. There's some adaptation related activities. You've got some green infrastructure in there. You've got some gray infrastructure there. You know, there is no silver bullet to address um, uh, the flooding issue in the city for, for businesses and, and for residents. And so you have to take a, a strategic and, and integrated approach. And business and, and institutions are also undertaking a number of activities. There's been a big expansion here at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery over the last number of years. They've got an ongoing expansion. Um, but they've done it in a climate smart way and I think uh, when we see leadership from the city and, and other actors in the region that really helps to, to propel others along, right? We, we build on the good and we're able to leverage that forward. As we start to think about or as the city and others start to think about what's ahead of you, what are, what are some of those key points that um, you'll be thinking about um, as it relates to climate and, and flooding here? Right. So. I guess going through the, the same four things that we just mentioned with the DAMF program, uh, on the city's end, we'll be looking through those avenues. Uh, we have a uh, higher uh, level of work that we know we'd like to accomplish, but we need to do some more detailed work. Uh, so what I mean by that is, is we know it floods from the riverside, but does it flood through the ground? Uh, some, of the, some places in town have sandy soils. Uh, sometimes there's a, an old corridor that water can flow through to get through the backside of, of different things. So. Uh, we want to make sure we look at all the different aspects and I think standing here in front of the art gallery uh, there's some good examples of mitigation measures that uh, people even in their home can can take up so uh, they're just a little bit of a different scale there's uh, just beside us here there's a generator that they have they have some pumps so they some pumps they run during the flood period so uh, they have some pumps but then they've included some backup power uh, so that's one of the steps you can take here uh, they have some stop logs in their entryway so that prevents water from flowing in through the doors uh, stop logs are a pretty aggressive measure that you might not take up at your house, uh, but there are other things you could use at your home, like sandbags and other things like that. Uh, part of the part of the things they've done here is uh, they actually have uh, the bottom floor that that they do see flooding in. They know that flooding might occur, so uh, when the flood season's coming, they make sure they get everything that's valuable out of the basement, so the water can come in and out if it needs to, and nothing will get impacted that that is important to them. Uh, and I guess finally, one of the things that uh, we see is is just people getting prepared and, and talking about the flood. It's important not to forget the floods because they, they happen uh, not necessarily every year. So it seems that uh, we have a short memory of some of these things. So uh, all of a sudden they happen again and people aren't prepared. So one of the biggest things is to keep the conversation going. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really hard to be even fathom flooding standing here today on a beautiful fall day as the, as the sun comes up over the river. It just, it, it just doesn't fathom in our, our thinking, um, you know, and for folks that, that are watching, uh, the water essentially, you know, comes up to a couple of feet below uh, where we're standing um, to, to the trail, essentially, that's just right behind us here. So, well, thank you so much for that, Jody. I really appreciate hearing a bit about the city of Fredericton and what's happening in the downtown core. We're going to chat a little later on about some of the neighborhoods and, and what's happening there. So for the folks watching us live across, uh, well, wherever you might be, we certainly want to thank you for uh, coming to visit us here on the Woolastook, and we look forward to uh, sharing some of these sites with you as we spend the next hour or so touring around on both sides of the river here and talking with various actors to see what's happening on the ground and, and what people are doing to ensure a healthy and resilient uh, St. John River and the species, people, and wildlife that uh, depend on it.
So I'm here standing on the bank of the Nashwalk River immediately opposite the downtown core of Fredericton. This is an important habitat for a number of rare and endangered species and obviously provides a really important buffering capacity when we have flooding in the region. I'm joined by Marika Chaplin from the Nashwalk Watershed Association and Marika I'm hoping you can tell us a bit about the association's work. Yes, I'd love to. Our organization has been around for 25 years. We're celebrating our anniversary this year and um, we're really excited for that. We've been involved with watershed issues for the past 25 years and one of our major projects is right here within the Greenway and I know you've, you've seen the video so you know about that so it's really nice to be here in person and we do a lot of ecological restoration specifically in this type of habitat. As you can see, we're surrounded by mature silver maple trees, and uh, they are the original trees that would be in the floodplain for the Nashwalk River. Over time, of course, land has been cleared and development pressures and agriculture and other threats have removed these trees from the floodplain. Luckily, we have them in this particular location, but our goal as a watershed organization is for the, over the next 10 years, we're aiming to uh, restore 71 hectares of cleared land into floodplain forests. So it's a very lofty goal and uh, we're working hard at it and we're looking for um, all sorts of partners for that. And I know WWF Canada has been one of those big helpers to us to help move this forward. We do rely very heavily on partnerships because we are a grassroots NGO. So we have great goals, uh, but we want to work together with people to make them happen. And one example of that is if you can imagine trying to restore 71 hectares of this to, to, to become forest like this requires a lot of resources. And an example of that is we partnered with three local native hardwood tree nurseries in the larger Woolastook watershed. And so they're growing these types of trees, the silver maples primarily, and uh, they're also growing burr oaks and red tip willows to enable us to restore habitats like this. And we also have other projects on the go that we're very proud of. We do a lot of work with fish passage, so making sure that the Nashwalk River is connected to all its tributaries as best as we possibly can. And certainly with the changing climate and with flooding, that's even more important because all, these, all the species that live in the river, they need places to go to with the changing climate. And so we do a lot of culvert assessments and we're installing fish ladders to help fish move up barrier culverts within the watershed. We also do a lot of outreach. We do workshops and we are very excited to be working with schools. Obviously with the pandemic, we have had to change things, but we're really excited. We have as many schools as a normal year that are coming out and we do a really good outdoor education program. So we're looking forward to getting kids outside and in the watershed. No, that's super Marika. And it's so important at this uh, juncture in time to, uh, to be able to connect people with um, nature. And, and you've obviously got a lot of excellent programming going on. You've touched on floodplain forests. Um, and a bit of their role uh, as it relates to flooding and, and climate change. Can you sort of give us a little more detail on that? Why is this forest and, and this area so important from a flood adaptation perspective? Thanks for asking. So this type of floodplain forest is the most converted type of habitat in Eastern North America because of development pressures and patterns of settlement. But at the same time, restored floodplain forests harbor like twice the biodiversity of upland forests. So there's a great opportunity. Yes, you know, we've lost a lot of our forest, but in restoring it, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity in restoring it. And the tree that you're standing behind is a mature silver maple. Um, when, once the silver maple is mature, it can uptake 220 liters of water per hour which is huge. And then of course it releases into the atmosphere, which from a flooding perspective is like a, a made in nature solution to, uh, to a lot of the problems that we're facing. And if you love trivia, <laughs> which I'm sure you may, <laughs> um, a, a single silver maple annually can intercept 11,000 liters of rainfall. So what a wealth we have around us. And uh, those are some of the sort of trivia details about why this floodplain forest is so important. So of course, once again, the biodiversity, carbon sequestration, 
uh, having trees on a shoreline is so much better than having grass because tree roots can hold a lot more sediment than the puny roots of grasses, relatively speaking. And so we don't have, with large rain events, which we're having more and more of, we're not going to have all that sedimentation in the river. And then the fish that are living in the river won't be stressed out by all the extra sediment in the river. So that's another benefit. Like there, there really are so many benefits to having a vegetated buffer. Uh, and I guess another one is climate change scientists say that having a well-vegetated buffer is like one of the, the most important things for, for um, protecting us uh, against climate change. So yeah. green spaces are, are really, really important. <laughs> yeah, well, and particularly right here on the Nashwalk, we're literally yeah. a stone's throw from the, from the city of Fredericton. And, and earlier you spoke about the need for partnership uh, to get projects like this done. Can you, can you speak to the nature of those partnerships and, and how that feeds the work and supports the community that's interested in this? Yes, I can. So the city of Fredericton is an, an, an important partner to the Nashwalk Watershed Association, and I, I hope it's vice versa. Uh, so we have been working since 2011 on two properties that are upstream of this location. Together, they are 68 hectares in size. They're Neal's Flats and Marysville Flats. They're both completely floodplain properties. They have wetlands on them, which are significant. And they, um, they're, reti they're primarily retired hay fields. One of them actually is currently hayed annually, so it's, it's actively being used, and it would have been mature floodplain forest. So uh, we are working with the city as stewards of those properties, and annually we plant a couple thousand trees at Marysville Flats. We don't just do that ourselves, we partner with people. So tomorrow, we're partnering with Siemens Canada. They're bringing their staff to volunteer and we're gonna hopefully plant over 200 trees thanks to, the, to their support. And that's on a city, so the partnership is, is many fold, right? We've got the city providing the land, we've got local trees from a tree grower, we've got volunteers from Siemens Canada, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really exciting project. And we are also working with the city. The city has drafted a conservation easement for the property, for one of those two properties I mentioned. And so it's in its final stages. And we're really excited to have that additional conservation measure in place. When it is, um, when the legal document is finally signed, it will be the first municipally owned conservation easement in our province. So we're quite excited for that. Yeah, no doubt the Conservation <laughs> Easement Act is about 20 years old and <laughs> it's, uh, it's now being put to good use, which is, which is fantastic. So there's lots happening for the Nashwalk Watershed and, and um, the association as, as a whole. As you look out five, 10, 15 years, um, you know, blue sky it for us. What, mm -hmm. uh, what does the Nashwalk Watershed uh, look like and, and how have we improved the situation for species uh, and, and habitats? Ecological restoration takes time, so I am more comfortable with a, a longer term view because when you plant a tree, you don't see instant results. However, the joy in planting a tree is that you can put something into the ground that you know if, ha if it has the right amount of time and the right conditions, it will survive and create biodiversity, will mitigate floods, um, sequester carbon for hundreds of years to come. So that, that is exciting for us to think about. So that is one of our main areas that we're focusing our work on is ecological restoration. And I mentioned uh, 71 hectares. We've got our work cut out for us for those 15 years. Uh, that's a lot of trees to plant. And uh, we're looking forward to planting silver maples and bur oak, which is actually a rare species here in New Brunswick and unique to, to, to the watershed. And in addition to that, of course, we, we, we're still very committed to fish passage. And we have to remember that with a changing climate, we sometimes, some people can think about themselves and their own impact to their own infrastructure with flooding or with drought. Uh, but we also have to think about, like, in these waterways, there's a lot of life. And we have to, we want, as an organization, to think about the diversity of those species and, and their survivorship as well. So that's why we're, we're doing all this fish passage work because the connection there, of course, and cold water tributaries are essential as well, because if it's hot and dry at one point in the river, in the main stem, those fish need to have a cold water place that they can go. I mean, this year we saw another level, like record low levels of water and record high levels of water temperature. So we need to 
we need to restore also some of those uh, cold water tributaries that, um, that have been Im impacted as well because of a non-vegetated buffer. So those are the, some of the things and we're always, we're always looking for, for different partnerships. We, um, we try to do the very best that we can in that regard. We, uh, we were um, electrofishing last week and we were super lucky. We had uh, staff from uh, Woodstock First Nation, uh, Kingsclear First Nation and Oromocto First Nation. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is so cool. And they're all in the Nashwalk watershed and they were assessing five of our projects that are improving fish passage. So they're, they're, they're assessing whether uh, those projects are going to be benefiting endangered species such as the Atlantic salmon or the American eel. And of course they are, so we're gonna, we're gonna keep going with that too. Yeah, so thanks for that, Marika. Clearly there's a lot happening within the Nashwalk watershed and you're working at multiple scales within this watershed on small cold water tributaries, you know, on the main stem and then we're obviously just steps away from the Woolastook River here. So I'd, I'd like to hear from you, you know, what are some of the key lessons learned um, for your association for doing work like this? You know, wh what does it take? Um, hmm. Who needs to be involved? And if you can just sort of wrap that all together for us so that others can can really get the nugget out of it, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, thanks, Simon. So, um, well, we're a local group, but we're always looking beyond us, so we're aware of what's going on federally, and we've really appreciated WWF's Canada role here in New Brunswick, and uh, your study from 2019, WWF Canada study with RSA Insurance, really confirmed to us the reality, which is that um, of the people that believe that flooding has increased, 47% that it could be attributed to not having enough green space to help uh, prevent that flooding. And so that reinforces the work that we're doing here and we, and we want to send that message throughout the Willistook. We need green spaces, we need them particularly in our urban areas. Our province, of course, has, we've had some really, it's become a bit of a hot real estate market, but at the same time, we need to balance that with having green areas that can be holders of biodiversity, that can help with uh, the impacts of flooding and a changing climate. Uh, and they, they hold so much value for us. Uh, we, don't, we really don't want to have those forgotten about. And we also do need to work very much at the community level. We have a landowner conservation program on private land in the province. And there again, we're reiterating the importance of well-vegetated buffers. You know, folks like to have a view on the river, which is understandable, but we do also need to protect our shorelines from erosion. So there again, it comes back to those green spaces to help us build resiliency in this time. And then in terms of the larger Willistook, we do need to work together. Like it needs to be at all levels, it needs to be the NGOs, the indigenous communities, provincial government, municipal governments, uh, businesses, school children, you know. If, you're, if your child comes home and says they planted a tree, and, and I guarantee you this, kids understand the importance of planting trees. They get it, that they are doing something good by planting a tree. And so starting from that kind of, you know, very simple act, and reaching out, uh, I think we've got huge potential. We need to remember that rivers are dynamic. Like, they have a floodplain because they need to move in their floodplain, right? They don't have a floodplain just for decoration. So we need to remember that that area, a river can move over the, it does move. And so um, having any development infrastructure in a floodplain uh, would be highly unadvisable now going forward for sure for any new developments. Um, it's unfortunate for people that have invested in infrastructure in the floodplain and they will need to think about what the future holds. Maybe they need to move some of that infrastructure because realistically we can expect more flooding next year. It may happen, it may not, but the, the pattern is there uh, and, and we can't deny it. And it's clear that people are getting the message. I really noticed that, I guess it was the 2019 election and uh, Fredericton sent its first green MP, well, the province sent its first green MP outside of BC to the federal government. And, and she campaigned, this is Jenica Atwin, she campaigned on the issue of flooding. And it resonated with people because people in Fredericton are wor very worried about flooding and in the Willistic in its entirety, it's a, it's a big concern. 
That's, that's super, Marika. Thanks so much for summarizing that for us. And I look forward to, uh, to learning more about your success uh, going forward beyond the, beyond the 15 year mark. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>
And so a lot of these actions, they relate back to river flooding, obviously maintaining health and safety. Um, there's a lot of work that already happens uh, through EMO and alerts. We wanna try and see what can be done to make that system even more robust over time and, and reaching people the way that um, they would like to be reached and right. interact it with, right? We know that everybody has a cell phone now, so what can we do there to make sure people are being reached? With buildings and with our infrastructure, um, Jody has probably talked a little bit about uh, our disaster mitigation and adaptation funds. So the city put in an application through Infrastructure Canada um, to get some flood resilience money and we were successful with that. So after over the next eight years with, uh, with help from Infrastructure Canada, we plan to put $28 million worth of projects together to address flooding. So those are in four areas. So that's in our core municipal infrastructure. So things like pump and lift stations, making sure that those are still operational during the flood and we don't lose those. Maintaining our transportation infrastructure, building some resilience there. So that looks like building some roads up, looking at are there places where we can build berms so that um, that road infrastructure isn't impacted like it currently is. And then we're looking at building some resilience in some neighborhoods or the neighborhoods that regularly flood that we can do some work on, some infrastructure work on to, to minimize that to some degree. And then the other part that we're doing is, and it's more in relation to the stormwater flooding, but we are looking at um, how we uh, acquire and expand some wetlands in the upper watershed. Wow, so this is like a ton of work. So it's good to hear all the lingo around resiliency. Um, so that's promising as well. But based on all of this information, you've alluded to some examples already, but can you tell us how that will really work in practice? Yeah, so there's a lot of pieces. Like I said, we're gonna move on that infrastructure piece and there's a pretty good plan in place over the next eight years. Priorities may shift a little bit, um, but we feel pretty confident that there is a good package put together there on the, on the gray infrastructure side. I think we're looking more and more at natural infrastructure. You can see behind us, there's a green wall. So we're looking at more projects to see how uh, natural infrastructure can help us. Again, expanding wetlands, things like that. Another big thing is community partnerships. So we have all kinds of organizations here, people with all kinds of skills, and, and we've been tapping into those networks and, and we're working on how we can expand that and how we can create more partnerships. So a good example is uh, during the summit, we've heard from St. John River Society. They're working on a project to help nonprofits with pre and post flood messaging and municipalities. So we've been a partner on that project since the beginning to help out with that. Um, so we see a huge value there, being able to um, have coordinated messages along the river uh, to really help residents and businesses prepare and, and kind of pick up the pieces afterwards. Um, we think it's really important. So we've partnered with them. We're working with Greater Fredericton Social Innovation, who's putting together basically an open space forum for individuals and nonprofits that are interested in um, figuring out what they can do, what their space is in addressing uh, climate change and river flooding um, and trying to come up with some new actions and solutions. So we're working closely with them and we really support that action. Um, there's always a piece for us um, or there usually is when, when these groups come together um, but we're seeing where they want to go and where they want to take the lead and how we can support and that's right. a very important uh, piece for us. Yeah. So a lot of collaboration going on, which is awesome. So last thing, we're obviously beside this living wall. I've actually walked by it a couple times now. So what can you tell us about this specific living wall and how does this sort of natural infrastructure fit into the city's plans? Yeah, so this was one of the city's first natural infrastructure projects. There is a retaining wall. Obviously, it looks a lot nicer than a big gray yeah. cement retaining wall. Uh, lots of living things growing on it. It's great and it holds everything in place. And so we're looking forward to seeing how we can implement natural infrastructure in the future. There's another wall just down the trail here in a place where it regularly washes out and okay. that's new as well. Um, we support uh, the Nashawak Watershed Association with their planting along the Nashawak with silver maple and, and other species to help hold that uh, bank in place to decrease erosion. So we're really supportive of this idea. We're still learning, right? So this is somewhat new uh, territory for municipalities to be getting into, but there's a lot, there's a lot there that uh, I think we can work towards and learn about. 
Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here with thank us you. today. If you go back about 20 years or so, uh, we've been working on the, I guess, the inclusion of green initiative or adaptation projects into our infrastructure room for many, many years. But as we look at our planning each year, what we tend to do is look at the age of the infrastructure that's there. We look at trying to get all the various components of infrastructure so that we're replacing as much of the assets at the end of their life as we can. One of the roles of the city is to try and keep its citizens safe. And when we have bigger events like we've had in the last number of years, the windstorms, the uh, flooding of the St. John River, city staff are put in the position of going out to try and make sure people are safe, they're protected. Even with a change in climate or changes to the weather patterns that we've seen, uh, we can be more resilient. So from a flood preparedness perspective, uh, we do have some key sections of roadway that are raised but we also have some areas that we have some valving on and the valving is used to do provide short-term protection from the floodwaters itself. With respect to the 2018 flood the background knowledge that we've built up uh, gave us the ability to react to the flood and to manage the flood. Ferguson uh, has collaborated nationally with experts across the country to look at ways to build more resilient, more adaptive infrastructure. I would say we're quite far ahead across the country. The idea of adapting to our changing climate and building resiliency in Fredericton is not a one-off thing. It's actually ingrained in our cultures. With the changing climate that we have, we've seen changes in the weather patterns, changes in our winters, changes in our events and storms, uh, that we're building the right infrastructure back. And we're taking into account the changes we're seeing and building things that will make the city more resilient in the future. We're right here on Waterloo Row in downtown Fredericton. The St. John River is right here behind me. And most of this neighborhood is actually built up on the terrace or the, or the floodplain. We're joined by uh, Jody from the city of Fredericton. And Jody, can you tell us a bit about some of the issues faced in the neighborhood here uh, when flooding happens? Yeah, sure, Simon. Uh, basically in this area, what we see when the water starts coming up in the spring freshet, the water washes usually over, over land into the neighborhoods. Uh, since the topography is kind of high along the waterfront, and slopes down as you go inland. Uh, there is, uh, and during longer floods, when they aren't quite as high, we do see water coming up through the ground as the, there's fairly sandy soils here. So that's another thing to contend with in longer duration floods. So Jody, can you tell us a bit about what some of the uh, homeowners are doing in this neighborhood to ad address the flooding? Uh, the things we see, it, it depends on the types of flooding, but uh, usually when the flood comes up fast, you see water flowing over land in through windows, cracks and foundations things like that, any low areas. So usually people at those times uh, have any valuables that they can easily take out of the basement. Their electrical, uh, any electrical things are raised up above the flood level in their homes. Uh, during slower floods, when the, the sewers start backing up and water starts running more through the ground, they start seeing water coming up through uh, the foundation floors uh, or start coming in through the ground. And, and again, as, it, as the flood stays longer, it gets up higher back in land. So, they have to start protecting other things using things like sandbags, uh, sump pumps, uh, and any other types of barriers they can to keep water out. 
So we've uh, talked a bit about what happens at, at the household level, but obviously we're in a community neighborhood here. We have sidewalks, we have storm sewers, um, we have roadways. Can you speak a bit to how that is impacted by flooding and, and what is the city and, and others doing to address that? Right, so Waterloo Row here that we're standing on is one of the main connectors uh, from different parts of town such as Lincoln. So it's a main transportation corridor. Uh, a lot of people use it for active transportation and the public transportation system. So, so whenever the flood happens, a lot of people are impacted from, through traffic. So that's one of the key things that, that we look at. How, what are alternate routes? Uh, what can we do to maintain traffic during the floods? Uh, and then in different areas, uh, we look at our infrastructure. So if there are storm sewers, they of course get inundated with water. Sanitary systems stop working as well. Uh, we do have to keep our lift stations running to keep the water pumping uh, as it pulls it away from houses. So there are things we look at to help mitigate any problems from the floods. Does the city have a plan uh, for undertaking this work uh, within the municipality? Does it happen, for example, in one year or is it spread over multiple years? And how do you make the decisions as to what is a priority? So we actually created a matrix uh, originally when we started, I guess we received uh, disaster mitigation adaptation funding, which is was originally a nine year program. Uh, we have seven years remaining of that program now to implement different things on our list. So we, we put different items together and in weighted categories. Uh, we use transportation, uh, household impacts, uh, critical infrastructure impacts, and a few other things like that to help us see where we should go first. Uh, and we've started implementing some of those things now, which we will be carrying out through the next seven years. Uh, uh, things we've actually installed along here are, are backwater valves in our storm sewer. So they were low-hanging fruit that we could get in there easily to see what kind of impacts we could mitigate. Uh, so now we've installed them. We actually raised the manholes up where we were there to keep the flood water from overtopping the manholes. Uh, the next level of things in that order would be start looking at the actual storm system itself, see if there's any leaks in the system, repair leaks. Uh, and then actually looking at the topography of the land. So are there key pieces of roadway we can raise to either keep the road open or help protect homes behind it? Uh, things like even just raising a trail like we're standing on here. Uh, if we raise up the trail, we don't actually have to change the roadway as much. So we may be able to road part, raise parts of the trail to help protect the homes in behind without the additional cost of raising roads. Uh, and then on the back end of that, we also want to look at do some soil tests and, and uh, whatnot to make sure that we're covering all the bases. So there's some opportunity here to build on existing infrastructure and then to ultimately improve the, the naturalness, I guess, of some of these areas um, and use those nature-based solutions as a means for addressing your, uh, your overland and, and freshet flooding issues. Yeah, that's right. I guess the big thing we want to look at is that at the end of the day, we don't want to implement something that maybe flooding happens from a different direction or maybe it runs through the ground too fast. So we really want to make sure we have all the aspects covered off. Well, building on a, building on a floodplain brings some issues. So um, obviously that wasn't so much of an issue when the, this neighborhood was settled, but um, it's obviously built up and, and this is a prime part of, uh, prime bit of real estate here in the city of Fredericton. Just one last question for you. Um, you know, based on all of your work with, with individuals, with residents, households, and then the neighborhood, what are some of the lessons that you've learned? What are some of the nuggets that um, other municipalities and other actors can take home uh, when undertaking uh, projects of this scale? Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of calls annually, of course, and one of the important things is to not have any knee-jerk reactions to things you're seeing. So you want to make sure you research those items. Of course, other municipalities experience same things. There's other experts working with different groups. They see they have a different angle on, on items and, and have some more expertise on different levels. So it's good to work with other groups. Uh, it's also good to listen to the residents in your city because they are living the, the floods that happen and they see where the water comes in and out. So it's good to hear what their experiences are to, to see how the events unfold. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, thank you, Simon.
So here we are at the end of our virtual St. John River Summit. Uh, we've had a great time exploring some of the projects in and around the city of Fredericton uh, with a number of different actors. And so to wrap up, we're just going to have a bit of a discussion about, uh, you know, why is the river important and how does flooding and climate change uh, fit into its future? Just to start with, um, you know, access to the river is really important here in the city. You can't go anywhere without seeing the river. Uh, we have a fantastic trail network. Um, we have boat launches, all of that sort of thing. What do you think is, or, or why is this access just so important for us here uh, in the city? So I guess it's important for us as a city to make sure that when we work on construction projects, we rebuild everything so it's sustainable and resilient. Uh, and of course, we, we put the mitigation piece on top of that because we want to make a vibrant community for everybody to live and work in. Yeah, that's fantastic, Jody. I absolutely agree. I think for me, a big part of um, having the river here and providing access is that it actually helps to develop that stewardship ethic. So, you know, despite having issues around flooding, people, when they engage with the river, start to care for it more um, and really uh, take an interest in its, uh, in its health. So following that up, we've talked a lot today about um, climate change planning in and around the Fredericton region. And I'm, I, I think people would be interested in hearing, um, you know, what are some of the largest lessons learned um, from a planning perspective when it comes to climate? I think, Simon, there's a few lessons we can learn when we're planning for climate change, especially on the river. Um, we need good access to information. We need to know what the projections are for the future, but we also need to be mindful that uh, what we think is going to happen may not always be what happens. We've seen some pretty bad floods here over the last couple of years, and we need to continue to learn from what we've seen in the past and to kind of expect the unexpected and, and do the best we can. Um, I think the other piece that's so important to me is that, um, you know, we have a role as the city, there's a role for nonprofits, for residents, for businesses, we're all going to play a part in, in adapting and uh, there's just a lot of action that we need to take where we need to come together and collaborate. That partnership piece is imperative, Brittany, but I think we all bring different skill sets to it and a lot of the time it's about figuring out um, who, who has what information, what knowledge, uh, what state is it in and, and how do we bring that together. So to bounce that question over to Marika a little, you know, what does that mean to you from a watershed organization, community-based perspective? Thanks, Simon. So yeah, climate change is a really complex issue and it's one of the things that we've talked about in our strategic planning. Like, it's a really hard threat to solve. So we really need to work together on it. And, uh, and it, we're in an enviable position as a watershed group. It looked all of our projects go better if we involve more people, if we have partnerships with Indigenous communities. We love working with the City of Fredericton. We have a couple huge projects that we have been able to move forward thanks to the City, including a very large dam removal and, of course, the uh, conservation easement for Marysville Flats. So we really value those kind of partnerships. And, and also, I think we always need to remember to look even beyond our, our local area and look nationally and see, you know, what is working nationally. And, and that's one of the things that we really appreciate about WWF Canada is that you have done the surveys, you have done the work. And so we can really um, continue all of us to look to your leadership and, and to take some lessons learned and, and to be very active here in our local communities. Well, thanks for that, Marika. We appreciate the opportunity to be working in the region with you and so many others. And I think being able to bring uh, expertise from outside of the region, um, access to national resources is a real benefit. And, and we're always looking to leverage that. Sort of following that up today, we've talked a lot about um, nature-based solutions and using nature to fight climate change um, and how this can also address the biodiversity crisis. Uh, I, I'd be interested in hearing from folks as to, you know, how do we encourage more uptake of, of nature-based solutions um, and ultimately uh, move that dialogue and action on the ground forward? Great question, Simon. So uh, I, I guess one of the examples that we have is on city-owned property. It's right here in, in Marysville. And we completed this work in 2017. So it's not, the property is not owned by us, but we bring people there and we encourage uh, staffers to do the same. It's a 30 meter section of eroding bank that was heavily undercut prior to our work. And we worked with a local engineering company to design a bioengineered riverbank restoration 
which includes a couple components, but most not notably, I guess, are there's a much less rock than you would see in traditional rock armoring and a resloping, which means instead of putting a wall to the river when we have flooding, uh, with the resloping, the water flows over it. So we're not sending that problem downstream, and, and that that's one of one of the examples I think we can we can bring people to a place and show them this is an alternative to um, rock armoring your property, and it of course is a nature-based solution. Great points, Marika. Having this, having these examples and being able to get people out um, and and experiencing them is a really important step. And I think for me. You know, for the city of Fredericton, we're starting to see them emerge as leaders um, on this front and the climate front uh, up and down the St. John River. And that's that's a critical piece, right? We we need to have that leadership example. So from from the city's perspective, um, you know, what, what's going to propel you to do more of this uh, work and and to share it more broadly? Thank you, Simon. I think the best way that we can help uh, create green initiatives is, is to work with uh, partnerships up and down the river to make sure that uh, when we in implement projects we work with all the groups we can to get the best knowledge to to help get the best solution in the best place uh, and on the other side of things with as a municipality we can create bylaws and help encourage development so when development occurs we make sure we get the right developments in the right location uh, so it helps encourage active transportation uh, things like bioswales or plantings on their on their developments and and help retain any wetlands or any sort of environmental features that we might have in the city. I just add to your point, Jody, it's been really interesting working alongside with you guys in the engineering department for my role, seeing uh, this new approach or a different approach to engineering where you're adding so much uh, to the natural infrastructure side where I think before, you know, it was a lot of great infrastructure that was being done and, and we did nature-based things for different reasons, whether it was preservation or um, for, for clean air by planting trees and all, all of these good other good reasons, but it's been really interesting to see things kind of flow into this nature-based solutions where it's it's both engineering and it's, and it's for, you know, these other great natural natural benefits as well. So that's been a really, really interesting thing for me. And I, I think that there's so much room to grow. And, and I think that's where we really value those partnerships with uh, Simon and, and World Wildlife Foundation and with the, the uh, watershed organizations. Um, they have so much of this knowledge already. Um, they're out there gleaning all this from, from around the globe and around the country and can give us some best practices. And I think it really brings us some knowledge and, and we're able to be leaders here and then put it back out uh, to the other communities around us. Yeah, good point. And uh, certainly we've been really pleased. I mean, we love working with engineers <laughs> at the city, but it's really nice to have someone with a biology background as well because they help I think it helps it really helps to have an environmental coordinator at the city and to kind of round out that that perspective as well uh, engineers are very good at solutions and uh, it's nice to have the natural science component in there as well so thank you for doing that great work the environmental or the flood forum and some of the the uh, educational pieces that the city has put out I think have been a really good step in the right direction and we look forward to keeping that message going and, and sharing it among our networks as well. That's a great point, Marika. Not only are we working at multiple scales in the watershed, but we're also working at, at different scales in our organizations. And it doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's an NGO or it's a municipality or it's a consulting firm, we need to be bringing those expertise in and rounding the package out um, so that we can get those nature-based solutions to uh, not only fight climate change, but also fight the biodiversity crisis. So it's a win-win it's a on that front. So, I, mean, I just wanted to say thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, the work that World Wildlife Fund puts into these summits is absolutely fantastic. It's great to bring everybody together and to be able to share what we've learned and what we've been doing and to learn from others. And it really helps build that collaboration piece and partnership piece for us. We, we meet all kinds of people and we get to think through some projects and we carry those forward throughout the year. So it's really helpful. So thank you for organizing. Brittany, I, I really appreciate it, and, and it has been a team effort. Thanks to the City of Fredericton for being involved. Um, you and, and Jody have really gone out of your way to accommodate us um, on this virtual tour and, and the planning for the summit. So thank you so much for that, and also uh, to our partners uh, at the Nashwalk Watershed Association for being involved in this virtual tour. This is the first time for this one. Um, 
you know, hopefully we don't have to do too many more of these, but if we do, at least we'll be prepared. And, um, you know, we're grateful for our audience to, uh, to tune in and to hear what is going on in the region and, and the effort that uh, communities and so many other actors and individuals are making to ensure a, a healthy and resilient St. John River for the, the wildlife and the people that live here and, and call this home. So uh, don't be afraid to check out our social media channels and see, learn about some of our other work. And uh, we'll call it a wraps for today and um, move on to what's next. <laughs>